daily life. <laughs> Are you spoiled? No. I am. Of course, I like to tell most Americans that they're spoiled, but no, really. Spiritually, are you spoiled? I think of myself as being spoiled because, you know, give me an example. It was like, I move plants in and out, you know, and I'm getting my little starters going, you know. They're growing, even though it's kind of cold at night, you know, down the 30s. and I've had to move them around and kind of mix up the places and times and get it all situated. But irregardless, I managed to get the plant started, you know, and kind of getting the boxes built for tomatoes and all those other things. But I really enjoy sometimes, you know, what God has done when it came to coming out here and spending time with you, you know, on video. You know, I have my, my hummingbird feeder and it seemed like, you know, there was about three or four days when I was going through some tough times that I came out, you know, and the hummingbird wasn't there. You know, I mean, we've got a bunch of them, you know, they're around all over the place, and I kind of went, well, that's odd. You know, I don't see the hummingbirds anymore. You know, and I thought, well, I wonder if the cold ran them off. No. <laughs> it was timing. But, you know, it's funny, I came out and I was recording the other day, and I sat down, and all of a sudden I heard the, you know, the little flutter that you can hear. And so I froze, and sure enough, there was another new new little hummingbird, you know, a new one, you know, a little tiny one, but still, nonetheless, it was there, and it was beautiful. I mean, it's a little tiny one, you know, and one of the things that they can do on this hummingbird feeder is that they can actually land on it, and then they can, you know, feed from it, you know, without having to fly. So sometimes they fly, sometimes they land. And it was kind of neat, you know, so I said, you know, thanks, Lord. I said, that was kind of what I needed, you know, it encouraged me. And lots of times, that's what we all need. We all need a little encouragement, you know. Things that you can look at in your day, you know, that kind of give you hope, you know, like the hope of your calling, or that inspire you, you know, to go that extra mile. Something that you can put your finger on and you can say, ha, this is how far I've come. And then you can set your goals and your your ideas of how far you want to go. And then you move forward with that. And that's kind of inspiring, you know. It kind of helps you by your own self-discipline to move forward in that way. And that's what I like. I like being able to have some type of discipline in order to move forward. Because I sure don't want to move backwards. And going sideways, well, you know what happens when you go sideways you wind up sideways. <laughs> Makes perfect sense to me. And that's kind of the neat thing about life itself, is that it's kind of obvious. Once you begin to experience it, you begin to see that there are certain principles that you can apply to your life that will make it easier or harder. It will make it meaningful or superficial. Life itself is going to happen, irregardless of whether you learn from it or not. But it's your choice, based upon your experiences, whether you make it easier, whether you make it more enjoyable, whether you make it challenging, whether you make it exciting, or whether you make it boring and dull and drab, or whether you whine and complain, or however you seem to be today. Because the reality is, life goes on anyways. So deal with it. <laughs> I mean, really, you can enjoy it or not. You can participate with it or resist it, but it's going to happen. Life happens. And that's one of the things that you get to do when you choose to maybe read a devotional. It can inspire you to rise out of your circumstances to an occasion to do something more than what you might have thought of. You see, that's what God wants to do. He wants to inspire you to be more than what you are. He wants to conspire your circumstances to create you in a way responding to them so that you'll go after something more than just being content with where you're at. You see, when you're just sitting around doing nothing, you're actually ending, let's see, how do they say it, your, your declination rather than your acclination. In other words, you're not moving forward, you're, <laughs> I was trying to think, it's the law of physics, everything's wearing down. You're wearing down. You're not growing or developing or becoming more of a person. You're kind of like slipping away, you know? And that's where the idea of backsliding comes from, is that it's like you're heading up a hill and you're sliding backwards. Or 
kind of like Romaine used to say, you know, that you're a slippery fish. You know, you're like one of those trout, you know, that God grabs you, you know, and you're a slippery fish and you're always jumping out of his hand, you know, trying to swim upstream, you know, and God wants to put you somewhere else. Well, you know, all of those analogies, such as they are, really, life is up to you. If you decide to be miserable, not only can you, you are. If you decide to be happy, not only can you, you will. If you decide to involve yourself in some kind of bondages or some kind of, you know, addictions and you get stuck, you know, you're stuck. It's kind of like when you have a flat tire. Hey, no matter what you do, you're going to have to change that tire sooner or later, you know, and you have to deal with life. And that's one of the things that devotions help you deal with. And that's why we use devotions as our emotional way of relating Jesus in a personal and intimate way because God knew that. Jesus gave us expressions that he said, sayings that he said, things that we could cling to and hold on to, that we could put our faith in that would always last for eternity, that they would be sound advice, wisdom for us that we could live by. And those things that are recorded in the Word of God, that's why we read it. But more than that, that's why we should think about it. We should understand and consider and if it says to do then we should do it resist the devil and he will flee from you when the enemy shall come in like a flood the Spirit of the Lord shall lift up a standard against him get thee hence Satan for it is written thou shalt worship the Lord thy God and him only shalt thou serve and then the devil leaves him and behold angels came and ministered unto him be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might Put on the whole armor of God, that you might be able to, that you might be able to stand against the wiles of the devil, and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them, lest Satan should get an advantage of us. We are not ignorant of his devices. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walks about seeking whom he may devour. Whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same affliction are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. This is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifies. And so you see, like it's said there in this word, in the world everyone suffers affliction. Everyone goes through it. But the difference between a Christian going through affliction and someone in the world, even if it's a worldly Christian, in the world is that they treat it as though it were something, you know, to be shunned. And the Christian treats it as something to be turned over to God. Because in the world we're told we would have tribulation. But that we could be of good cheer because Jesus has overcome the world. Each and every one of us, in some way, will be tempted by the devil. Most people overreact and think everything is the devil made him do it and that's not true most of the time I find carnal Christians are influenced by their own carnality they look at something on television they begin to indulge their fantasies or their lusts they begin to get excited or somehow indulge in the thought process and they begin to think on it and then consider it and ponder it and pretty soon they're out committing some kind of sin or like hyping themselves up to make Friday, you know, thank God it's Friday, as though it were some special day. It's one day just like another day. Every day is the same, as far as the Lord's concerned. He created it and he said, this is the day the Lord has made. We can rejoice and be glad in it. Every day we can rejoice. Every day we can be glad. But if we indulge in our flesh, we're being misled by ourselves. If we are tempted by Satan, that's a little different story. That's when you kind of get into things that really aren't so obvious. And those are the things that I see a lot of people on Facebook or ministries or other areas of life do. When they want to point the finger at someone and tell them they're bad or they're doing something wrong or jump on the bandwagon and stomp on them or romp on them or, you know, chomp at the bit just looking forward to somehow, you know, telling them how bad they are, how they've done something stupid. Why? Why bother? Everybody knows that it was wrong or it's bad or it's stupid or whatever it may be. But now that they need some comfort, aren't we the ones who in our affliction 
we are supposed to turn our affliction into the opportunity to minister to someone else in the same affliction that we've been afflicted with? Isn't that why Jesus suffered and died? So that we likewise would be able to give of that same spirit that he was comforted? That's what you're called to do, to be a comforter. To be, yes, conformable to his image so that at times, with discernment, you may be able to say something's wrong about the statement, but not the person. And it's not the sin and the sinner thing, but it's the person that you want, really, to love. You want to forgive. You want to have mercy upon them. You want to be kind-hearted towards tender. Oh, sure, the words themselves. I'm one of those types of people that has discernment. I'm able to confront the theology of it or the, the consequences of the statement. But the person themselves, if they ask me, you know, no problem. Hey, I love you, man. You know, you just said something stupid. That's all. <laughs> you know, get over it. Move on with it. Move on with life. Move forward and discover that there's more to life than chewing on someone else's leg. Because the reality is that's when Satan has deceived you rather than you being deceived. See, we deceive ourselves on a lot of things and we get ourselves into trouble and we learn from it and get out of it and God forgives us and moves on and you learn the hard way more often than not. Sometimes, some people learn the easy way. Most of us learn the hard way. And when we learn the hard way, we discover that if we would just turn to God at the immediate time of our sin, the immediate time of our temptation, we would be forgiven. We could move on. We could go forward. We could actually look like a hypocrite. No, really, seriously. A lot of non-Christians think it's kind of hypocritical to be able to ask for forgiveness and to get it. But to put it bluntly, that is why Jesus died, so that we could be forgiven. Because if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And there's no waiting, you know, till you feel bad enough, guilty enough, or you have to do some extra repentance in order to go to God and ask for forgiveness. Man, not me, man. I'm running right there immediately and saying, God, you know, you need to help me to stop doing this so that way I can quit asking for forgiveness because I'm getting tired of asking. I'm sure you're getting tired of giving, but I'm glad that it's already been done. So... I always ask for forgiveness immediately, as soon as I know that I've done something contrary to the Word of God. Maybe you should try that. Maybe you should think about how quickly you should run to God, then run away from Him. How quickly you should forgive others, then to condemn them. How quickly you should turn the other cheek, then to assert your rights and privileges. How quickly you should ask God for wisdom, like James 1.5 than to assume you already know the answer. That's really the only time we should make haste, and that's to turn to the Lord our God. Because if we would turn to Him, then we would be saved from most of our problems and issues that we face every day as we're learning to live this life His way, His will, His perfect plan for our lives as He leads us today, as He guides us each and every day that we're alive.